you your own Pope. It has an aura of mystery. In the 1930s, the world fell in love with Hollywood's boldly Hispanic take on Art Deco. Glamorous, exotic, high-tech and not afraid to show off. I'm going to get a taste of the Hollywood Art Deco lifestyle in none other than Devon. Oh yes, very nice. I'm slowly picking my way down a very, very narrow road in Devon with terrible speed bumps. So I'm not going to be racing down there. Looking for a house. And we're passing lots of houses, which are all very beautiful, but not really the thing we're after. We're trying to find a, a small piece of Hollywood transplanted to Devon Riverside. But we may not make it. Oh, I did that one better. And it's like all these secret places. Lots of woods, lots of boats, lovely blue water, very lush indeed. Oh my God. Hold on, I've got to go in reverse. Just... That's it, Casa del Rio. I was told this was a Hispanic Hollywood style mansion. And you know, I didn't really believe it, but when you see it, it is. It's everything it says it is. <laughs> Including an impossibly steep drive. That really is a very, very American house. I think I've got the wrong car. I need something posher. Let's have a look round. Very Spanish. Well, very Hollywood Spanish. But, uh, it's in Devon. This big veranda here. And these sort of Romeo Romeo balconies. It's a real fantasy dream home. And it's a great thing. This is really one of the big Spanish things, which is having a patio with these shallow stairs coming down your kind of courtyard with these lovely flowers and all this cream reflecting the light and tiled roofs it's a sort of Hollywood Cordoban imagery there should be women out on these balconies really welcoming me but, uh, I haven't got the budget Oh, marble. Fantastic. It's always nice to be welcomed into a house by a, a film star, Mary Pickford. Oh! Uh, Douglas Fairbanks. Within seconds, I'm in a place that clearly used Art Deco to say Hollywood. It's a fantastic stairwell. And it's got this very interesting feature here, which is a sort of iron grill over an open window. And the idea of this style, when it was done in Hollywood, was that somehow this was a castle that had become a palace. And so the remains of the entrance to the dungeon lies in the turret. And then of course, you have this fantastic black and white staircase. And going up it, it's nothing. But the thing about this, is you can make a fantastic entrance. I mean, not a bloke, obviously. But if you swan down here, you're the king or queen of this castle. And people are, well, you're framed by this really very deco black and white floor, the black and white stairs. You'd be wearing black and white. You'd be like a little Fred Astaire traipsing down the stairs. It's fantastic. And equally, there's this lovely balcony again up here. And the other thing you've got is this great feature here. Balcony. You're your own Pope. 
And the thing about this staircase, it's the centre of the house. Anyone coming up or down has to go through it. And the whole thing is geared to be looked up at. You've got all this strap work on the ceiling. And someone's thrown a card up there. That must have been a good shot. And then down, you've got this wonderful pattern. So the whole thing, the whole drama of being in this house is animating the people in it. Every room has a purpose to make you look good. In theory. I'm staying for a night. The owner, Andrew Pearson, is there to welcome me. Hello. Hi there. He's dedicated to preserving the mansion's sense of deco drama. So this was the entrance to the house here. Here, this side? This was the front door. So how did you get into that? So property? the carriages and the early cars arrived at the bottom there by the river. And their carriages or cars early on would park there. And they walked with their robes for dinner along the rose garden, up through the steps, through the rosary, onto this terrace and through to the house. So that makes sense of this huge facade here because that's the real presence of the house would be announced from below and you come up to this turret. And the main dining room was through there. And then there was two sitting rooms which could be used for a concert or other entertainment. And then you would move into the house. So people came in off the terrace, having had a rest from the climb from the road and the river, and then took a view of this marble staircase and the black and white flooring. Yeah, this Which, is fantastic, isn't it? Yeah, this is all the original marble, and the extensions on the ground floor have all copied this uh, Italian marble. Casa del Rio was built in 1935 by Walter Price, a baker who sold bread throughout the West Country. Clearly he was an entrepreneur because he'd gone to the States to research the bread industry and discovered, for himself anyway, the value potentially of introducing sliced bread here. So he introduced sliced bread to Britain? That's what the story goes. <laughs> and he was the best thing since sliced bread? I think <laughs> history may uh, decide otherwise on that because the records around him are somewhat scanned. But what he did do was to meet with um, Douglas Fairbanks and Mary Pickford as part of his review of the Californian bread industry. And it was really that, that he fell in love with the style, the Spanish style of house, because theirs was one of the first Beverly Hills houses mm -hmm. on this sort of location. They had chosen an area at the top of the end of a long drive and built that house, Pickfair, in 1919. But what I think is really amazing is that he went to America and apart from room that sliced bread, he also decided to build a, a Spanish house in Devon. There are no other Spanish houses around here, anything like it. I mean, if he'd been, I don't know, a normal kind of English entrepreneur, he might have built a, an arts and crafts house or something like that, but no, a Hollywood house. It was the style of the house, and undoubtedly some of the people he met at the dinner parties and, and their sort of friends that they... He obviously had a very social time with Mary Pickford. Mary Pickford and her husband, Douglas Fairbanks, were the most famous Hollywood couple of the time. And they built Pickfair, a fantasy Hollywood home which inspired Walter Price to build his Hispanic take on it. He took the concept of a Spanish house set on a hillside and scoured the Devon River Valleys for a site, and he found this site just a mile and a half down from the Yelm Hotel, which was the only other property there then. And he wanted 17, 20 acres on the side of the Yelm, facing southwest, in a secluded valley, where he could have a backdrop of a very secluded, warm garden. Well, he certainly picked a fantastic site. Casa del Rio is Hollywood upstairs and Hollywood downstairs. So this is the cinema. That's wonderful. That's absolutely marvellous. And this was created on the principle that Pickfair was actually a place of real activity and escape. And what they did there was over a number of years to have not only riding and swimming and tennis and golf, but they then put in a bar, and if they could have had a cinema 
what we've done is to recreate what we think Mary would have done, but she didn't like looking at her old films. So really you're developing the, the theme of the house, the desire of the house to be a Hollywood house. So are these cinema seats? No, these come from an old building in Wales and uh, they were found by my team when we were creating this games area and there were some 300 of them and we've picked the best 30. You know what this really needs? A cocktail and a Fred Astaire film. But that wouldn't be a rerun of Pickfair because Douglas Fairbanks was a teetotaler and the guests for dinner at Pickfair were not served wine. But her last present to him, the Christmas before they separated, was actually a, a Texan bar put into the basement because it was she who liked to drink. It was a present for her, really. Exactly. For Walter Price, the house was a monument to his success. From the veranda, I notice a lost part of his tribute to Hollywood. Of course, the elephant in the room in this garden is the fact that this lawn shouldn't be here at all. Really, there's a swimming pool here. So you'd be stood up there watching lovely people swim up and down. And actually, when you're down here, you can see just here the edge of the pool. The ground sinks down a bit and it's a bit bleached out. But it must have been great because as a, as a lawn, it means nothing. But as a great patch of blue surrounded by this lovely garden, it says glamour. Now for something Art Deco exotic. It's cocktail hour. The great thing about doing a programme about Art Deco is an excuse to make a cocktail. And there's a lovely book here, the Savoy Cocktail Book. 1930, right in the period. Lovely orange and black details, very, very Art Deco colours. And it's written in a kind of jolly style. And it's got lovely illustrations. And it's got hundreds, hundreds of cocktails in here. And of course, this was written against the background in America of prohibition, although this was published in England. And um, cocktails, as far as I can tell, in the main, are to disguise bad booze. And I'm going to make a whiz bang, which is, slightly scarily, absinthe, grenadine, orange bitters, vermouth, and whiskey. Shake well and strain into a glass. So, take the lid off. First ingredient always seems to be a good amount of ice. I want to add absinthe, absinthe. Well, I have no idea what dash is, so we'll have to improvise. Dash, looks like paraffin. Next one, grenadine. Orange bitters. Looks very dangerous. French vermouth. That's a third, whatever a third is. Now comes the hardest judge of all, two thirds whiskey. I like whiskey. Lightning flashes between your wrists as you shake the cocktail. Yes. Very pink. I think you're supposed to do it until you can't feel your hands. Give that a go. The other thing I know about cocktails is you're not supposed to sip them. You're supposed to drink them. Oh, it, it, it doesn't look good. Right, I think it's glasses off for this. Mmm, cheers. Oh yes, very nice. Can't taste a thing. Oh, might have another. It's like paint. Time for the final treat of the day. The thing about these Hollywood films is they gave everyone in the world access to the same popular culture and nothing spread Art Deco culture more than Hollywood. It may have begun in France, it may have begun with the rich and with luxury, but by the mid-30s it was American. It represented a life that most people in Europe just couldn't imagine. They'd had peace, they'd had plenty, and even in the Depression, they had glamour. 
and films like this offered you a view into another world which you could only dream about living in. The Atlantic, but the Atlantic isn't romantic and the Pacific isn't what it's cracked up to be. And the thing about Fred is he's a polished, shiny gent. And you're just waiting for Ginger Rogers and lots of nightclubs and lots of cocktails and lots of shininess. And that's really what you're here to see. And the thing is, anywhere, even here in the heart of Devon, a film was never more than a bus ride away, so everyone could see them. It was really the first global popular culture, and Art Deco was the background. And actually sitting in this nice private cinema, guzzling cocktails and watching Fred Astaire, well, it's a lovely way to end the day. In the 30s they discovered sunglasses, which is just as well, because those cocktails are shocking. Everything's a little bright, so I just need everything toning down a bit. And these rooms are lovely, because you've got this balcony, you can see everything. Every room has a view, and every room has a view of the estate. And this is the best view. And the rooms are also great, because they have washing facilities. So once you're in your room, you may never come out until you're fit to see the world. The bathrooms are fantastic. This one's a bit pink, but the best bathroom's down here. This corridor's lovely. The arches of the doors are matched by the arches through the corridor. And just these little arches transform what is really just an access corridor into a little bit of Spanishness in the plastered ceiling as well. So, these details really make the place. But look at this. This is fantastic. This is a proper 30s bathroom. And if you're tall, the best bit, the absolute best bit... Oh. Look at that. Anyone. You'd have to be a giant not to fit in this bath. I imagine if you're short, it's a bit of a problem. But it's great. But more importantly, the black bath, it's important that it's fashionable. The taps are all moulded, these octagonal forms. These are really, really deco. The bright chrome instead of soft nickel is an important finish. And the contrast with the green. So you've got black, gold, green, the green becomes deeper as you reach the floor, and the round sink, everything in the end plays together. And over here, you've got this lovely, lovely sort of um, shelf and a mirror. And um, if I used hair dryers, I'd use this hair dryer. So really, you could come out of your room and just, um, as I should really, prepare yourself for the world. Time for a spot of breakfast. I'm going to demonstrate a toaster now. This is a modern loaf, and of course, it doesn't fit the toaster. So we'll have to adjust the bread to fit. Try again. Oh, yes. And the great thing about this toaster is it's a self turning toaster. In about an hour and a half, that should be nicely done. The thing about the 30s is you had the kind of birth of modern food convenience. You can cobble something together fast. And uh, I don't know. 
It's kind of urban food. People have forgotten that, but if you live in a city, you need packets of butter. And the toaster, it works. And sauces, these proprietary sauces, they began to be advertised with winning bylines, so that they became more than the sauce in the bottle. They became a, a kind of product that everyone wanted to have. How is a bottle modern? Well, you give it an Art Deco shape, this lovely octagonal shape kind of communicates todayness about sauce. Are we there? Yeah, we are. Great. And that's the thing about Art Deco. It is not so much a coherent design aesthetic. It's a mood. But it's a mood that um, people who marketed stuff were only happy to apply to every product under the sun. Do I want that much sauce? The answer is yes. I hope it doesn't spill. Oh yeah, that is great. Electric power changed the lives of the middle classes in the 1930s. Ian Peterson, curator of the Museum of Electricity and a collector of devices. Oh, hi, and I'm glad you could come, because uh, this is an early electric house, but I don't know anything about electricity supply in the 30s. Was it easy to get? Well, in the 19, late 30s, there was, there'd, there'd been this massive expansion in the grid. Most of the new buildings, they were being sold to the middle classes, and the middle classes, they wanted everything to be very new. I mean, they were exposed to all these American influences through film and yeah, everything else. Yeah, particularly in a house like this, yeah. And they wanted to have the latest pieces of equipment and gadgetry, just like we are now. Look at this, this is fantastic. Yeah, that's a 1935 Belling, like all manufacturers. Uh, they were very, inf of the period, they seemed to be influenced by the streamlined shapes. They're like go-faster stripes, yeah. aren't they? This is, exactly. I was looking down here and you've got this kind of wheel with speed coming yeah. off it. And with the orange of the elements together, the orange and green would be very, very jazzy. Yeah, and it's a contrast to the browns of the Baker lights, yeah. a, a, a majority of the Baker light of the period. So we've got pottery, and it's lovely green pottery to give you a, a different flavour, if you like. Bakelite, I have got a radio, come with me. All right. So what do you know about this radio? It's an Echo, it's 1935. Beautiful Bakelite casing. Bakelite was pioneered by the Germans, but Echo built a massive factory producing Bakelite radios. For the period, they were, they were state-of-the-art. They were wonderful pieces of kit. It, it's humming. I think there's a crackle. I'll go around the back here. Let's see if we can get it to pick something up. It's the French. It's really clear. This is an American toaster, mid-30s. You put a slice of toast in each one. This is obviously for a family of four. So, this is American, not English? American. Yeah, they seem to um, they seem to be a bit further ahead of, than us on the design of a lot of these appliances. So you, you put the bread in, you do one side, and when you're ready to do the other side, you just do that. Four slices in one go. And then when it's ready, you go to you the like that mid position. And four people can take a slice out. Bingo. So, what is this? This is um, a rather lovely um, electric kettle. It's American, and uh, I, I just like the way that they've even managed to get all this lovely Art Deco feel to something which is basically a piece of household equipment that you use every morning to, in, I suppose in America, and make your coffee. And I think the thing that I like about it is the colour of it. It's bright, and it's not like a utility. You know, you'd be proud to have that on your table. Oh, yeah, definitely. So the last thing I want to ask you about is yep. this thing over here. 
a German hairdryer. I don't even know they had hair dryers in the 1930s. This is quite a nice one because this one's a German hairdryer. Beautiful chrome body, Bakelite handle. Um, but of course, all this, all this uh, demand for stuff it ended with the war. So in a brief phase, from sort of mid-20s to 1939, you get this blossoming of all these new products for us. And new design. And then it all just comes to a halt with the yeah. war. So they were just getting used to this new wonderful life and then it's all over. Yeah. That's a shame. It is, isn't it? Staying at Casa del Rio leaves me unexpectedly seduced by this Hollywood Hispanic folly. Bright, loud, showy and even a bit silly. It's very Hollywood and undeniably deco. As my stay in Casa del Rio comes to an end, I decide to get a final view of this marvellous building. Down to the bottom of the garden to see it from the river. Uh, it's just like wearing a uh, cardigan or something around there. There you go. Oh yeah, lovely. So Phil, if you could take us down river a bit so I get a good view of the house because I think it's the only place we're going to see the whole thing. From the water you can see the house is built on a little promontory in the river and that the house itself, the verandas are angled like that to look out over particular views. And although there's been all this building since from the house, you can't really see any of that. But the actual house itself stands high above everything around it. And it's obviously just much, much bigger. And all these little bungalows, they're lovely. But you know, that's a mansion. And as you come round, you get glimpses of bits of the house. And I thought you'd see the whole thing, but you don't. It's really private. From anywhere on the river, you can't see very much at all. Looking back, you never get more than a glimpse of a rather lovely window, these gorgeous coral shutters. And of all the houses in the village, the biggest one is completely disappeared behind a screen of trees. But where we are now, the whole house is slowly becoming obscured. So nobody's really going to look at you. I think you've got about three goes at waving at the butler to get the drinks ready. The one thing you can see from here is this huge roof line, which does suggest a really big house. And then we get this fantastic view of the stair turret, and it's straight out of Hollywood. And it's just so high compared to everything around it. And also just not of Devon. You know, it's like plonked here like some spaceship stucco spaceship. Well it's just disappearing behind the trees now and you never really get more than a glimpse. And it's a discreet place, you know you could be a secret man in there. And I think people were, nobody knows much about it. And it makes you speculate, you wonder what the hell's going on there. It has an aura of mystery. <laughs>